Okay, the Kabbalion introduction. We take great pleasure in presenting to the attention of students and in the investigators of the secret doctrines this little work based upon the world old hermetic teachings. There has been so little written upon this subject, notwithstanding the countless references to the teachings and the many works upon occultism, that the many earnest searchers after the arcane truths will doubtless welcome the appearance of this present volume. The purpose of this work is not the enunciation of any special philosophy or doctrine, but rather it is to give the students a statement of the truth that will serve to reconcile the many bits of occult knowledge that they may have acquired, but which are apparently opposed to each other and which often serve to discourage and disgust the beginner in the, in the study. Our intent is not to erect a new temple of knowledge, but rather to place in the hands of the student a master key which he may open the many inner doors in the temple of mystery through the main portals he has already entered. There is no portion of the occult teachings possessed by the world which have been so closely guarded as the fragments of the hermetic teachings which have come down to us over the tens of centuries which have elapsed since the lifetime of its great founder, Hermes Trismegistus, the scribe of the gods, who dwelt in old Egypt in the days when the present race of men was in its infancy. Contemporary with Abraham, and if the legends be true, an instructor of that venerable sage Hermes was, and is, the great central son of occultism, whose rays have served to illumine the countless teachings which have been promulgated since his time. All the fundamental and basic teachings embed in the esoteric teachings of every race may be traced back to Hermes. Even the most ancient teachings of India undoubtedly have their roots in original hermetic teachings. From the land of the Ganges, many advanced occultists wandered to the land of Egypt and sat at the feet of the master. From him, they obtained the master key, which explained and reconciled their divergent views, and thus the secret doctrine was firmly established. From other lands also came the learned ones all of whom regarded Hermes as the master of masters. And his influence was so great that in spite of the many wanderings from the path on the part of the centuries of teachers in these different lands, there may still be found a certain basic resemblance and correspondence which underlies the many and often quite divergent theories entertained and taught by the occultists of these different lands today. The student of comparative religions will be able to perceive the influence of the hermetic teachings in every religion worthy of the name, now known to man, whether it be a dead religion or one in full vigor in our own times. There is always certain correspondence in spite of the contradictory features, and the hermetic teachings act as the great reconciler. The life work of Hermes seems to have been in the direction of planting the great seed truth which has grown and blossomed in so many strange forms. Rather than to establish a school of philosophy which would dominate the world's thought, but nevertheless the original truths taught by him have been kept intact in their original purity by a few men each age, who, refusing great numbers of half-developed students and followers, followed the hermetic custom and reserved their truth for the few who were ready to comprehend and master it. From lip to ear, the truth has been handed down among the few. There have always been a few initiates in each generation in the various lands of the earth who kept alive the sacred flame of the hermetic teachings. And such have always been willing to use their lamps to relight the lesser lamps of the outside world. When the light of the truth grew dim and clouded by the reason of neglect, and when the wicks became clogged with foreign matter, there were always a few to tend faithfully the altar of truth, upon which was kept a light, the perpetual lamp of wisdom. These men devoted their lives to the labor of love, which the poet has so well stated in his lines. Oh, let not the flame die out. Cherished age after age in its dark cavern, in its holy temples cherished, fed by pure ministers of love, let not the flame die out. These men have never sought popular approval. 
nor numbers of followers. They are indifferent to these things, for they know how few there are in each generation who are ready for the truth, or who would even recognize it were it presented to them. They reserve the strong meat for men, while others furnish the milk for babes. They reserve their pearls of wisdom for the few elect who recognize their value and who wear them in their crowns, instead of casting, casting them before the materialistic vulgar swine who would trample them in the mud and mix them with their disgusting mental food. But still, these men have never forgotten or overlooked the original teachings of Hermes regarding the passing on of the words of truth to those who are ready to receive it, which teaching is stated in the Kamalion as follows. Where fall the footsteps of the master, the ears of those ready for his teaching open wide. And again, when the ears of the student are ready to hear, then cometh the lips to fill them with wisdom. But their customary attitude has always been strictly in accordance with the other hermetic aphorism. Also in the Kabbalion, the lips of wisdom are closed, except to hear the ears, except to the ears of understanding. There are those who have criticized this attitude of the Hermeticists and who have claimed that they did not manifest the proper spirit in their policy of seclusion and reticence. <coughs> But a moment's glance back over the pages of history will show the wisdom of the masters who know the folly of attempting to teach to the world that which it was neither ready or willing to receive. The Hermeticists have never sought to be martyrs and have instead sat silently aside with a pitying smile on their closed lips while the heathen raged noisily about them in their customary amusement of putting to death and torture the honest but misguided enthusiasts who imagined that they could force upon a race of barbarians the truth capable of being understood only by the elect who had advanced along the path. And the spirit of persecution has not yet died out in the land. There are certain hermetic teachings which, if publicly promulgated, would bring down upon the teachers a great cry of scorn and relievement, uh, I'm sorry, a great, a great a cry of scorn and revilement from the multitude who would again raise the cry of crucify, crucify. In this little world, we have endeavored to give you an idea of the fundamental teachings of the Kabbalion, striving to give you the working principles, leaving you to apply them to yourselves rather than attempting to work out the teaching in detail. If you are a true student, you will be able to work out and apply these principles. If not, then you must develop yourself in, into one. For otherwise, the hermetic teachings will just be as words, words, words to you. So that's a good intro there. I mean, uh, I like that. <coughs> it sounds like this is going to be right up our alley. Um, but yeah, again, you know, if you're not, if you're not ready for it, it's just going to go over your head anyway. Chapter 1, The Hermetic Philosophy. From old Egypt have come the fundamental esoteric and occult teachings which have so strongly influenced the philosophies of all races, nations, and peoples. For several thousand years, Egypt, the home of the pyramids and the Sphinx, was the birthplace of the hidden wisdom and mystic teachings. From her secret doctrine, all nations have borrowed India, Persia, Chaldea, Medea, China, Japan, Assyria, ancient Greece, and Rome, and other ancient countries partook liberally at the Feast of Knowledge, which the Hierophants and the masters of the land of Isis so freely provided for those who came prepared to partake of the great store of mystic and occult lore which the masterminds of that ancient land had gathered together. In ancient Egypt dwelt the great adepts and masters who have never been surpassed and who have seldom been equaled. During the centuries that have taken their processional flight, since the, the days of, of great, the great Hermes, in Egypt was located the great lodge of lodges of the mystics. At the door of her temples entered the neophytes, who afterwards as hierophants, adepts, and masters, traveled to the four corners of the earth, carrying with them precious knowledge, which they were ready, anxious, and willing to pass on to those who were ready to receive the same. 
All students of the occult recognize the debt that they owe to these venerable masters of that ancient land. But among these great masters of ancient Egypt, there once dwelt one of whom masters hailed as the master of masters. <coughs> if this man, or man indeed he was, dwelt in Egypt in the earliest days, he was known as Hermes Trismegistus. He was the father of the occult wisdom, the founder of astrology, the discoverer of alchemy. The details of his life story are lost to history, owing to the lapse of the years, though several of the ancient countries disputed with each other in their claims to the honor of having furnished his birthplace and this, and this thousands of years ago. The date of his sojourn in Egypt in that last, his last incarnation on this planet is not known, but it has been fixed at the early days of the oldest dynasties of Egypt. Long before the days of Moses, the best authorities regard him as a contemporary of Abraham. Yeah, Toph. And some of the Jewish traditions go, far, <coughs> go as far as to claim that Abraham acquired a portion of his mystic knowledge from Hermes himself. As the years rolled by after his passing from this plane of life, uh, tradition recording that he lived 300 years in the flesh, the Egyptians defied Hermes and made him one of their gods under the name of Toth. Years after, the people of ancient Greece, who made him one of their many gods, calling him Hermes, the god of wisdom, the Egyptians revered his memory for many centuries, yes, tens of centuries, calling him the scribe of the gods and bestowing upon him distinctively the ancient title Trismegistus which means the thrice great, the great great, the greatest great, the thrice born, etc. In all the ancient lands, the name of Hermes Trismegistus was revered, the name being synonymous with the fount of wisdom. Even to this day, we use the term hermetic in the sense of secret, sealed so that nothing can escape, etc. And this, by reason of fact, of the fact that the followers of Hermes always observed the principle of secrecy in their teachings. They did not believe in casting pearls before swine, but rather held to the teaching milk for babes, meaning strong men, meat for strong men, both of which uh, maxims are familiar to readers of the Christian scriptures, both of which have been used by the Egyptians for centuries before the Christian era. And this policy of careful dissemination of the truth has always characterized the Hermetics even into the present day. The hermetic teachings are to be found in all lands, among all religions, but never identified with any particular country, nor with any particular religious sect. This because of the warning of the ancient teachers against allowing the secret doctrine to become crystallized into a creed, the wisdom of this caution is apparent to all students of history. The ancient occultism of India and Persia degenerated and was largely lost owing to the fact that the teachers became priests and so mixed theology with the philosophy that the result being that the occultism of India and Persia has been gradually lost amidst the mass of religious superstition, cults, creeds, and gods. So it was with ancient Greece and Rome. So it was with the hermetic teachings of the Gnostics and early Christians, which were lost at the time of Constantine whose iron hand smothered philosophy with a blanket of theology, losing to the Christian church that which it's was its very essence and spirit, and causing it to grope throughout several centuries before it found its way back to its ancient faith. The indications apparent to all careful observers in this 20th century, being that the church is now struggling to get back its ancient mystic teachings. But there were always a few faithful souls who kept alive the flame tending it carefully, and not allowing its light to become extinguished. And thanks to these staunch hearts and fearless minds, we have the truth still with us. But it is not found in books to any great extent. It has been passed along from master to student, from initiate to hierophant, from lip to ear. When it was written down at all, its meaning was veiled in terms of alchemy and astrology so that only those possessing the key could read it aright. 
This was made necessary to, in order to avoid the persecutions of the theologians from the Middle Ages who fought the secret doctrine with fire and sword, stake, giblet, and cross. Even to this day, there will be found but few reliable books on the Hermetic philosophy. Although there are countless references to it in many books written on various phases of occultism, and yet the Hermetic philosophy is the only master key which will open all of the doors of the occult's teachings. In the early days, there was a compilation of certain basic Hermetic doctrines passed on from teacher to student, which was known as the Kabbalion. The exact significance and meaning of the term have been lost for several centuries. This teaching, however, is known to many to whom it has descended from mouth to ear, on and on, throughout the centuries. Its precepts have never been written down or printed, so far as, uh, so far as we know. It was merely a collection of maxims, axioms, and precepts which were non-understandable to outsiders, but which were readily understood by students after the axioms, maxims, and precepts had been explained and exemplified by the Hermetic initiates to their neophytes. These teachings really constituted the basic principles of the art of Hermetic alchemy, which, contrary to the general belief, dealt in the mastery of mental forces rather than material elements or the transmutation of one kind of mental vibration into other instead of the changing of one kind of metal into another. So it was dealing with yeah, mental vibrations. The legends of the Philosopher's Stone, which would turn base metal into gold was an allegory relating to hermetic philosophy readily understood by all students of true hermeticism in this little book of which this is the first lesson we invite our students to examine into the hermetic teachings as set forth in the Kabbalion and as explained by ourselves humble students of the teachings who while bearing the title of initiates are still students at the feet of Hermes the master we herein give you many of the maxims, axioms, and precepts of the Kabbalion, accompanied by explanations and illustrations which we deem likely to render the teachings more easily comprehended by the modern student, particularly as the original text is purposely veiled in obscure terms. The original maxims, axioms, and precepts of the Kabbalion are printed herein in italics, with the proper credit being given. Our own work is printed in a regular way, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Great. And went from went from reading somebody going in giving us information. So that according to the teachings, the passage of this book to those ready for the instruction will attract the attention of such as are prepared to receive the teaching. And like, likewise, when the pupil is ready to receive the truth, then this little book will come to him or her. Such is the law, the hermetic principle of cause and effect. And its aspect of the law of attraction will bring lips and ear together, pupil and book in company. So mote it be. All right, so uh, that's the chapter one of the Kabbali on there. Let's get into the Kabbali on uh, chapter two here for you tonight. The seven hermetic principles. The principles of truth are seven. He who knows these understandingly possesses the magic key before whose touch all the doors of the temple fly open. The seven hermetic principles upon which the entire hermetic philosophy is based are as follows. Number one, the principle of mentalism. Number two, the principle of correspondence. Number three, the principle of vibration. Number four, the principle of polarity. Number five, the principle of rhythm. Number six, the principle of cause and effect. Number seven, the principle of gender. These seven principles will be discussed and explained as we proceed with these lessons. A short explanation of each, however, may as well be given at this point. Number one, the principle of mentalism. The all is mind, the universe is mental. The principle embodies the truth that all, this principle embodies the truth that all is mind. It explains the all, which is the substantial reality underlining all the outward manifestations of appearances, 
which we know under the terms of the material universe, the phenomenon of life, matter, energy, and in short, all that is apparent to our material senses, is spirit which in itself is unknowable and undefinable, but which may be considered and thought of as a universal, infinite living mind. It also explains that all the phenomenal world or universe is simply a mental creation of the all, subject to the laws of created things, and that the universe as a whole and in its parts or units has its existence in the mind of the all, in which mind we live and move and have our being. This principle, by establishing the mental nature of the universe, easily explains all of the varied mental and psychic phenomena that occupy such a large portion of the public attention and which, without such explanation, are non-understandable and defy scientific treatment. An understanding of this great hermetic principle of mentalism enables the individual to readily grasp the laws of the mental universe and to apply the same to his well-being and advancement. The hermetic student is enabled to apply intelligently the great mental laws instead of using them in a haphazard manner. With the master key in his possession, the student may unlock many doors of the mental and psychic temple of knowledge and enter the same freely and intelligently. This principle explains the true nature of energy, power, and matter, and why and how all these are subordinate to the mastery of mind. One of the old Hermetic masters wrote long ages ago, He who grasps the truth of the mental nature of the universe is well advanced on the path to mastery. And these words are as true today as at the time they were first written. Without this master key, mastery is impossible, and the student knocks in vain at the many doors of the temple. Number two, the principle of correspondence. This principle embodies the truth that there is always a correspondence between the laws and phenomenon of the various planes of being in life. The old hermetic axiom ran in these words, as above, so below, as below, so above. And the grasping of this principle gives one the means of solving many a dark paradox and hidden secret of nature. And indeed say that's true. That's uh, that's one to me. That, that that's one of the secret ways of finding out. That that's the whole thing. You can find out what's going on. It's like if you see something going on in a small scale, then that means it's somewhere. You know, there's a good chance it's going on on a large scale somewhere else. And that's where you know, it makes you go, "Oh wow!" <laughs> there are planes beyond our knowing. But when we apply the principle of correspondence to them, we are able to understand much that would otherwise be unknowable to us. This principle is of universal application and manifestation on the various planes of the material, mental, and spiritual universe. It is a universal law. The ancient Hermeticists considered the principle, this principle, as one of the most important mental instruments by which man was able to pry aside the obstacles which hid from view the unknown. Its use even tore aside the veil of Isis, to the extent that a glimpse of the face of the goddess might be caught. Just as a knowledge of the principles of geometry enables man to measure distant suns and their movements while seated in his observatory, so a knowledge of the principle of correspondence enables man to reason intelligently from the known to the unknown. Studying the monad, he understands the archangel. Number three, the principle of vibration. This principle embodies the truth that everything is in motion. <coughs> everything vibrates, nothing is at rest. Facts which modern science endorses, and which each new scientific discovery tends to verify, and yet this hermetic principle was enunciated thousands of years ago by the masters of ancient Egypt. This principle explains that the differences between different manifestations of matter, energy, mind, and even spirit result largely from varying rates of vibration, from the all which is pure spirit down to the grossest form of matter. All is in vibration. The higher the vibration, the higher the position in the scale. 
The vibration of spirit is at such an infinite rate of intensity and rapidity that it is practically at rest. Just as the rapidly moving wheel seems to be motionless. And at the other end of the scale, there are gross forms of matter whose vibrations are so low as to seem at rest. Between these poles, there are millions upon millions of varying degrees of vibration. From corpuscle to electron, atom and molecule, to worlds and universes. Everything is in vibratory motion. This is also true on the planes of energy and force, which are but varying degrees of vibration. And also on the mental planes, whose states depend upon vibrations. That's where the term vibes comes from. Oh, I don't know, man. I got a bad vibe about that. Vibe is vibration. When you get a vibe from something, you're feeling the vibration of that, whether it be negative or positive. That's, that's a real term. That's where it comes from. And even on to the spiritual planes. An understanding of this principle with the appropriate formulas enables hermetic students to control their own mental vibrations as well as those of others. The masters who apply this principle to conquering of natural phenomena in various ways. He who understands the principle of vibration has grasped the scepter of power, says one of the old writers. Number four, the principle of polarity. This principle embodies the truth that everything is dual. Everything has two poles. Everything has its pair of opposites, all of which were old hermetic axioms. It explains the old paradoxes that have perplexed so many, which have been stated as follows. Thesis in antithesis, uh, antithesis, blah, thesis and antithesis are identical in nature but different in degree. Opposites are the same, differing only in degree. The pairs of opposites may be reconciled. Extremes meet. Everything is and isn't at the same time. All truths are but half truths. Every truth is a half. A half false. There are two sides to everything, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It explains that in everything there are two poles or opposite aspects, and that opposites are really only the two extremes of the same thing, with many varying degrees between them. To illustrate heat and cold, although opposites are really the same thing, the difference is consisting merely of degrees of the same thing. Look at your thermometer and see if you can discover where heat terminates and cold begins. There is simply no such thing as absolute heat or absolute cold. The two terms, heat and cold, simply indicate varying degrees of the same thing. And that same thing, which manifests as heat and cold, is merely a form, a variety, and a rate of vibration. So heat and cold are simply the two poles of that which we call heat. And the phenomenon attendant thereupon are manifestations of the principle of polarity. The same principle manifests in the case of light and darkness, which are the same thing, the difference consisting of varying degrees between the two poles of the phenomenon. Where does darkness leave off and light begin? What is the difference between large and small, between hard and soft, between black and white, between sharp and dull, noise and quiet, high and low, positive, negative? The principle of polarity explains these paradoxes, and no other principle can supersede it. The same principle operates on the mental plane. Let us take a radical and extreme example of love and hate. Two mental states apparently totally different, and yet there are degrees of hate and degrees of love in a middle point in which we use terms like like or dislike, which shade into each other so gradually that sometimes we are at a loss to know whether we, li we like or dislike or neither. And all are simply degrees of the same thing. As you will see, if you will think but, but, but a moment, and more than this, and considered, oh, that doesn't make any sense. And all are simply degrees of the same thing, as you will see, if you will but think a moment. And more than this, and considered of more importance by the Hermeticists, it is possible to change the vibrations of hate to the vibrations of love in one's own mind, and in the minds of others. Many of you who read these lines have had personal experiences of the involuntary rapid transition from love to hate, and the reverse, in your own case and that of others. And you will therefore realize the possibility of this being accomplished by the use of the will, by the means of the hermetic formulas. 
good and evil, but are the poles of the same thing? And the Hermeticist understands the art of transmuting good into evil by means of an application of the principle of polarity. In short, the art of polarization becomes a phase of mental alchemy known and practiced by the ancient and modern Hermetic masters. An understanding of the principle will enable one to change his own polarity as well as that of others if he will devote the time and study necessary to master the art. Number five, the principle of rhythm. This principle embodies the truth that in everything there is manifested a measured motion, to and fro, a flow and inflow, a swing backward and forward, a pendulum, pendulum-like movement, a tide-like ebb and flow, a high tide and low tide between the two poles which exist in accordance with the principle of polarity described a moment ago. There is always an action and a reaction, an advance and a retreat, a rising and a sinking. This is in the affairs of the universe. Suns, worlds, men, animals, mind, energy, and matter. This law is manifest in the creation and destruction of worlds, in the rise and fall of nations, in the life of all things, and finally, in the mental states of man. And it is with this latter that the Hermeticists find the understanding of the principle most important. The Hermeticists have grasped this principle. Finding its universal application have also discovered certain means to overcome its effects in themselves by the use of the appropriate formulas and methods. They apply the mental law of neutralization. They cannot annul the principle or cause it to cease its operation, but they have learned how to escape its effects upon themselves to a certain degree, but depending upon the mastery of the principle. They have learned how to use it instead of being used by it. In this and similar methods consist the art of Hermeticists. The master of Hermetics polarizes himself at the point at which he desires to rest and then neutralizes the rhythmic swing of the pendulum, which would tend to carry him to the other pole. All individuals who have attained any degree of self-mastery do this to a certain degree, more or less unconsciously. But the master does this consciously and by the use of his will and attains a degree of poise and mental firmness, firmness almost impossible of belief on the part of the masses who are swung backward and forward like a pendulum. Chapter 3 of the Kabbalion Mental Transmutation as we have stated, the Hermeticists were the original alchemists, astrologers, and psychologists. Hermes, having been the founder of these schools of thought, from astrology has grown modern astronomy. From alchemy has grown modern chemistry. From the mystic psychology has grown, form, grown the modern psychology of the schools, but it must not be supposed that the ancients were ignorant of that which the modern schools supposed to be their exclusive and special property. The records engraved on the stones of ancient Egypt show conclusively that the ancients had a full comprehensive knowledge of astronomy. The very building of the pyramid showing the connection between their design and the study of astronomical science. Nor were they ignorant of chemistry. For the fragments of the ancient writings show that they were acquainted with the chemical properties of things. In fact, the ancient theories regarding physics are being slowly verified by the latest discoveries of modern science notably those relating to the constitution of matter. Nor must it be supposed that they were ignorant of all the so-called modern discoveries in psychology. On the contrary, the Egyptians were especially skilled in the science of psychology, particularly in the branches that the modern schools ignore, but which nevertheless are being uncovered in the name of psychic science, which is perplexing the psychologists of today, and making them reluctantly admit that there may be something in it after all. The truth is that beneath the material chemistry, astronomy, and psychology, that is, the psychology in its phase of the brain action, the ancients possessed a knowledge of transcendental astronomy called astrology, of transcendental chemistry called alchemy, of transcendental psychology called mystic psychology. 
They possess the inner knowledge as well as the outer knowledge, the latter alone being possessed by modern scientists. Among the many secret branches of knowledge possessed by the Hermeticists was that transmutation, which known as mental forms the subject matter of this lesson. Transmutation is a term usually employed to designate the ancient art of transmutation of metals, particularly of the base metals into gold. The word transmute means to change from one nature form or substance into another. And accordingly, mental transmutation means the art of changing and transforming mental states, forms, and conditions into others. So you may see that mental transmutation is the art of mental chemistry. If you like the term, a form of practical mystic psychology. But this, this means far more than appears on the surface. Transmutation, alchemy, or chemistry on the mental plane is important enough in its effects to be sure. And if the art stopped, there would still be one of the most important branches of study known to man. But this is only the beginning. Let us see why. The first of the seven hermetic principles is the principle of mentalism, the axiom of which is the all is mind, the universe is mental, which means that the underlying reality of the universe is mind, and the universe itself is mental, that is, existing in the mind of the all. We shall consider this principle in succeeding lessons. But let us see the effect of the principle if it be assumed to be true. If the, universe, if the universal is mental, I think it's supposed to be universe, if the universe is mental in its nature, then mental transmutation must be the art of changing the conditions of the universe along the lines of matter, force, and mind. So you see, therefore, that mental transmutation is really like the magic of which the ancient writers had so much to say in their mystical works and about which they gave so few practical instructions. If all be mental, then the art which enables one to transmit mental, transmute rather, mental conditions must render the master the controller of material conditions as well as those ordinarily called mental. As a matter of fact, none but advanced mental alchemists have been able to attain the degree of power necessary to control the grosser physical conditions, such as the control of the elements of nature, the production or cessation of tempests, the production and cessation of earthquakes and other great physical phenomena. But that such men have existed and do exist today is a matter of earnest belief to all advanced occultists of all schools. That the masters exist and have these powers the best teachers assure their students, having had experiences which justify them in such belief and statements. These masters do not make public exhibitions of their powers, but seek seclusion from the crowds of men in order to better work. There may be, in order to better work, there may, yeah, it's just so much bad grammar in some of these books. In order to better work, there may along the path of attainment, whatever that means. We mention their existence at this point merely to call your attention to the fact that their power is entirely mental and operates along the lines of the higher mental transmutation of the hermetic principle of mentalism. But students and hermeticists of lesser degree than masters, the initiates and teachers are able to freely work along the mental plane in mental transmutation. In fact, all that we call psychic phenomena, mental influence, mental science, and new thought phenomena, etc., operates along the same general lines, for there is but one principle involved, no matter by what name the phenomenon be called. The student and practitioner of mental transmutation works among the mental plane, transmuting mental conditions, states, etc., into others according to various formulas. The various treatments, affirmations, denials, etc. of the schools of mental science are but formulas, often quite imperfect and unscientific of the hermetic art. The majority of modern practitioners are quite ignorant compared to the ancient masters, for they lack the fundamental knowledge upon which the work is based. Not only may the mental states of oneself be changed or transmuted by hermetic methods, 
but also the states of others may be and are constantly transmuted in the same way, usually unconsciously, but often consciously by some understanding the laws and principles in cases where the people affected are not informed of the principles of self-protection. And more than this, as many students and practitioners of modern mental science know, every material condition, depending upon the minds of other people, may be changed or transmuted in accordance with the earnest desire, will, and treatments of person desiring change conditions of life. The public are so generally informed regarding these things at present that we do not deem it necessary to mention the same at length. Our purpose at this point being merely to show the hermetic principle and art underlying all of these various forms of practice, good and evil. For the force can be used in opposite directions according to the hermetic principles of polarity. In this little book, we shall state the basic principles of mental transmutation, that all who read may grasp the underlying principles and thus possess the master key that will unlock the many doors of the principle of polarity. We shall now proceed to a consideration of the first of the Hermetic Seven Principles, the principle of mentalism, in which is explained the truth that the all is mind, the universe is mental. In the words of the Kabbalion, we ask the close attention and careful study of this great principle on the part of our students, for it is really the basic principle of the whole hermetic philosophy and of the hermetic art of mental transmutation. All right, so that's chapter three of the Kabbalion. We'll pick up on chapter four next time, which is probably titled after the last chapter there, The All. So we'll get into this. This is this this is pretty rad. This uh, this is like you know initiate mystery religion school shit right here. Um, I think it's important to go through this stuff and read this stuff uh, because you know up until now the only people who have access really for the most part to this type of information have been people who have been in the power structure and people who are using this type of knowledge for their own good. We we, we up until this point we have not had people alive who know about the evil rulers and controllers of the world and and the things they've done the crimes that they've committed against humanity and so we haven't had people that that know the the spiritual aspects of this and that things like you know we're, we're so programmed to think magic and all this stuff is fake and false but you know that, that that's the work of the magi convincing you that all of that stuff is fake and false Kabbalion for you here tonight. Chapter 4, The All. Substance means that which underlies all outward manifestations, the essence, the essential reality, the thing itself, etc. Substantial means actually existing, being the essential element, being real. Reality means the state of being real, true, enduring, valid, fixed, permanent actual, etc. Under and behind all outward appearances or manifestations, there must always be a substantial reality. This is the law. Man, considering the universe of which he is a unit, sees nothing but change in matter, forces, and mental states. He sees that nothing really is, but that everything is becoming and changing. Nothing stands still. Everything is being born, growing, and dying the very instant a thing reaches its height. It begins to decline. The law of rhythm is in constant operation. There is no reality, enduring quality, fixi fixity, or substantial substantiality in anything. Nothing is permanent but change. And those changes are permanent, but changes. Right? He sees all things involving from other things and resolving into, it sounds like yeah, they fucking wrote Tom Sawyer off of this. Uh, he sees all things evolving from other things and resolving into other things, a constant action and reaction, inflow and outflow, building up and tearing down, creation and destruction, birth, growth, and death. 
Nothing endures but change. And if he be a thinking man, he realizes that all of these changing things must be outward appearances or manifestations of some underlying power, some substantial reality. All thinkers in all lands and in all times have assumed the necessity for postulating the existence of this substantial reality. All philosophies worthy of the name have been based upon this thought. Men have given to this substantial reality many names. Some have called it by the term of deity under many titles. Others have called it the infinite and eternal energy. Others have tried to call it matter. But all have acknowledged its existence. It's self-evident. It needs no argument. In these lessons, we have followed the example of some of the world's greatest thinkers, both ancient and modern, the hermetic masters, and have called this underlying power, this substantial reality, by the hermetic name of the all, which term we consider the most comprehensive of the many terms applied by man to that which transcends names and terms. We accept and teach the view of the great hermetic thinkers of all times, as well as of those of illuminated souls who have reached higher planes of being, both of whom assert that the inner nature of the all is unknowable. This must be so, for not by the all itself can comprehend its own nature and being. The hermeticists believe and teach that the all in itself is and must be ever be unknowable. They regard all the theories, guesses, and speculations of the theologians and metaphysicians (coughs) regarding the inner nature of the all as but the childish efforts of mortal minds to grasp the secret of the infinite. Such efforts have always failed and will always fail from the very nature of the task. One pursuing such inquiries travels around and around in the labyrinth of thought until he is lost to all sane reasoning, action, or conduct, and is utterly unfitted for the work of life. He is like the squirrel which frantically runs around and around the circling treadmill wheel of his cage, traveling ever and yet reaching nowhere, at the end a prisoner still standing just where he started. And still more presumptuous are those who attempt to describe or ascribe the all, the personality, qualities, properties, characteristics, and attributes of themselves. Ascribing to the all the human emotions, feelings, and characteristics, even down to the pettiest qualities of mankind, such as jealousy, susceptibility to flattery and praise, desire for offerings and worship, and all the other survivals from the days of the childhood of the race. Such ideas are not worthy of grown men and women and are rapidly being discarded. (coughs) At this point, it may be proper for me to state that we may make a distinction between religion and theology. Let me get a drink here. Between philosophy and metaphysics. Religion to us means that intuitional realization of the existence of the all and one's relationship to it, while theology means the attempts of men to ascribe personality, qualities, and characteristics to it, their theories regarding its affairs, will, desire, plans, and designs, and their assumption of the office of middlemen between the all and the people And philosophy to us means the inquiry after the knowledge of things knowable and unthinkable. While metaphysical means the attempt to carry the inquiry over and beyond the boundaries and into regions unknowable and unthinkable. And with the same tendency as that of theology. And consequently, both religion and philosophy mean to us things having roots in reality, while theology and metaphysics seems like broken reeds rooted in the quicksands of ignorance and affording not but the most insecure support for the mind or soul of man. We do not insist upon our students accepting these definitions. We mention them merely to show our position. At any rate, you shall hear very little about theology and metaphysics in these lessons. 
But why the, while the essential nature of the all is unknowable, there are certain truths connected with its existence which the human mind finds itself compelled to accept. And an examination of these reports form a proper subject of inquiry, particularly as they agree with the reports of the illuminate, illumined on higher planes. And to this inquiry, we now invite you. That which is the fundamental truth, the substantial reality is beyond true naming, but the wise men call it the all. In its essence, the all is unknowable. The human reason whose reports we must accept so long as we think at all informs us as follows regarding the all and that without attempting to remove the veil of the unknowable, number one, the all must be all that really is. There can be nothing existing outside of the all, else the all would not be the all. Number two, the all must be infinite. For there is nothing else to define, confine, bound, limit, or restrict the all. It must be infinite in time or eternal. It must have always continuously existed, for there is nothing else to have ever created it. And something can never evolve from nothing. And if it had ever not been, even for a moment, it would not be now. It must continuously exist forever. For there is nothing to destroy it, and it can never not be, even for a moment, because something can never become nothing. It must be infinite in space. It must be everywhere. For there is no place outside of the all that it cannot be otherwise than, than continuous in space, without break, cessation, separation, or interruption. For there is nothing to break, separate, or interrupt its continuity and nothing with which to fill in the gaps. It must be infinite in power or absolute, for there is nothing to limit, restrict, restrain, confine, disturb, or condition it. It is the subject to no other power, for there is no other power. Number three, the all must be immutable, or not subject to change in its real nature, for there is nothing to work, there is nothing to work changes upon, nothing to which it could change, nor from which it could have changed. It cannot be added to, nor subtracted from, increased, nor diminished, nor become greater or lesser in any respect whatsoever. It must have always been and must always remain just what it is now, the all. There has never been, it is not now, and never will be anything else to which it can change. The all being infinite, absolute, eternal, and unchangeable. It must follow that anything finite, changeable, fleeting, and conditioned cannot be the all, as there is nothing outside of the all. In reality, then, any and all such finite things must be as nothing in reality. Now, do not become befogged nor frightened. We are not trying to lead you to the Christian science field under the cover of hermetic philosophy. There is a reconciliation of this apparently contradictory state of affairs. Be patient. We will reach it in time. We see around us that which is called matter, which forms the physical foundation for all forms. Is the all merely matter? Not at all. Matter cannot manifest life or mind. And as life and mind are manifested in the universe, the all cannot be matter. For nothing rises higher than its own source. Nothing is ever manifested in an effect that is not in the cause. Nothing is evolved as a consequence that is not involved as an antecedent. And then modern science informs us that there is really no such thing as matter, that what we call matter is merely interrupted energy or force, that is, energy or force at a low rate of vibration. As a recent writer has said, matter has melted into mystery. Even material science has abandoned the theory of matter and now rests upon the basis of energy. Then is the all mere energy or force? Not energy or force as the materialists use the terms, for their energy and force are blind, mechanical things, devoid of life or mind. Life and mind can never evolve from blind energy or force. For, this, for the reason given a moment ago, 
Nothing can rise higher than its source. Nothing is evolved unless it is involved. Nothing manifests in the effect unless it is in the cause. And so the all cannot be mere energy or force. For if it were, then there would be no such thing as life and mind in existence. And we know better than that, for we are alive and using mind to consider this very question. And so are those who claim that energy or force is everything. What is there, then, higher than matter or energy that we know to be existent in the universe? Life and mind. Life and mind in all their varying degrees of unfoldment. Then you ask, do you mean to tell us that the all is life and mind? Yes and no is our answer. If you mean life and mind as we poor petty mortals know them, we say no. The all is not that. But what kind of life and mind do you mean, you ask? The answer is living mind. As far above that which mortals know by those words, as life and mind are higher than mechanical forces or matter, infinite, living mind, as compared to finite life and mind, we mean that which the illumined souls mean when they reverently pronounce the word spirit. The all is infinite living mind. The illumined call it spirit. So that's the end of chapter 4 at the end of chapter 18 there. So we'll uh, pick up next time chapter 5, the mental universe. The mental universe. The universe is mental, held in the mind of the all. Uh, interesting stuff there. Yeah, uh, Kabbalion. Uh, not sure what they're driving out here, what they're trying to convince us of with this. It does seem like it has an agenda to it, but uh, uh, yeah, good, 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 interesting stuff. You know, I, like I said, you know, I don't always agree with everything I read, but I do like to read some of this stuff, especially, you know, any, any texts I can get my hands on that come from mystery schools or, you know, uh, secret society, something like that. I mean, I'm way into that. I'm way into, I'm way into reading that on air. Cause you know, it's like one of those things where we, we need to get this stuff out there. It needs to be documented. This needs to be on the record, you know, uh, because there just hasn't been enough people like myself doing this, reading this stuff out. And, you know, a lot of people I think are running around with, um, opinions and judgments on a lot of things that, that, they think they know a lot about, which they've never even bothered to study or read. I see that a lot in the quote-unquote research community. Uh, sad thing about the research community is there's not a lot of research going on. It need, 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 need more people doing it. But I uh, definitely salute those of you out there that are doing it. That's for sure. And uh, Chapter 5 of the Kabbalion, The Mental Universe. The all is spirit, but what is spirit? This question cannot be answered for the reason that its definition is practically that of the all, which cannot be explained or defined. Spirit is simply a name that men give to the highest conception of infinite living mind. It means the real essence. It means living mind. As much superior to life and mind as we know them, as the latter are superior to mechanical energy and matter. Spirit transcends our understanding, and we use the term merely that we may think or speak of the all. For the purposes of thought and understanding, we are justified in thinking of spirit as infinite living mind. At the same time, acknowledging that we cannot fully understand it. We must either do this or stop thinking of the matter at all. Let us now proceed to a consideration of the nature of the universe as a whole and in its parts. What is the universe? 
We have seen that there can be nothing outside of the all. Then is the universe the all? No, this cannot be. Because the universe seems to be made up of many, it is constantly changing. And in other ways, it does not measure up to the ideas that we are compelled to accept regarding the all, as stated in our last lesson. Then, if the universe be not the all, then it must be nothing. Such is the inevitable conclusion of the mind at first thought. But this will not satisfy the question, for we are sensible of the existence of the universe. Then, if the universe is neither the all nor nothing, what can it be? Let us examine this question. If the universe exists at all or seems to exist, it must proceed in some way from the all. It must be the creation or a creation of the all. But as something can never come from nothing, from what could the all have created it? Some philosophers have answered this question by saying that the all created the universe from itself, that is, that the being and substance of the all. But this will not do, for the all cannot be subtracted from, nor divided, as we have seen. And then again, if this could be so, would not each particle in the universe be aware of its being the all? The all could not lose its knowledge of itself, nor actually become an atom or blind force or lowly living thing. Some men, indeed, realizing that the all is indeed all, and also recognizing that they, the men, existed, and have jumped to the conclusion that they, the all, were identical. And they have filled the air with shouts of, I am God, to the amusement of the multitude and the sorrow of sages. The claim of the corpuscle that I am man be modest in comparison, but what indeed is the universe, if it not be the all? Not yet created by the all, having separated itself into fragments. What else can it be? Of what else can it be made? That is the great question. Let us examine it carefully. Here we find that the axiom of correspondence comes to our aid here. The old hermetic axiom, as above, so below, may be pressed into service at this point. Let us endeavor to get a glimpse of the workings on higher planes by examining those on our own. The principle of correspondence must apply to this as well as other problems. Let us see. On his own plane of being, how does man create? Well, first he may create by making something of outside materials, but this will not do, for there are no materials outside of the all which it may create. Well, then, secondly, man procreates or reproduces by the process of begetting, which is self-multiplication. Self-multiplication accomplished by transferring a portion of his substance to his offspring. But this will not do because the all cannot transfer for or subtract a portion of itself, nor can it reproduce or multiply itself in the first place. There would be a taking away, and in the second case, a multiplication or addition to the all, both thoughts being an absurdity. Is there no third way in which man creates? Yes, there is. He creates mentally. And in so doing so, he uses no outside materials. Nor does he reproduce himself, and yet his spirit pervades the mental creation. Following the principle of correspondence, we are justified in considering that the all creates the universe mentally in a manner akin to the process whereby man creates mental images. And here is where the report of reason tallies precisely with the report of the illumined. As shown by their teachings and writings, such are the teachings of the wise men. Such was the teaching of Hermes. The all can create in no other way except mentally, without either using material, and there is none to use, or else reproducing itself, which is also impossible. So it has to basically take what's there. There is no escape from this conclusion of the reason, which, as we have said, agrees with the highest teachings of the illumined. 
just as you, student, may create a universe of your own in your mentality, so does the all create universes in its own mentality. But your universe is the mental creation of a finite mind, whereas that of the all is the creation of an infinite. The two are similar in kind, but in infinitely different in degree. We shall examine more closely into the processes of creation and manifestation as we proceed, but this is the point to fix in your minds at this stage. The universe and all it contains is a mental creation of the all. Verily, indeed, all is mine. The all creates in its infinite mind countless universes which exist for eons of time. And yet to the all, the creation, development, decline, and death of a million universes is as the time of a twinkling eye. The infinite mind of the all is the womb of universes. The principle of gender is manifested on all planes of life material, mental, and spiritual. But as we have said before, gender does not mean sex. Sex is merely a material manifestation of gender. Gender means relating to generation of, or creation. And whenever anything is generated or created on any plane, the principle of gender must be manifested. And this is true even in the creation of universes. Now, do not jump to the conclusion that we are teaching that there is a male and a female God or creator. That idea is merely a distortion of the ancient teachings on the subject. The true teaching is that the all in itself is above gender. And it is above every other law, including those of time and space. It is the law from which the laws proceed, and it is not subject to them. But when the all manifests on the plane of generation or creation, then it acts according to law and principle, for it is moving on a lower plane of being. And consequently, it manifests the principle of gender and its masculine and feminine aspects on the mental plane, of course. This idea may seem startling to some of you who hear it for the first time, but you have all really passively accepted it in your everyday conceptions. You speak of the fatherhood of God and the motherhood of nature of God the divine father and the nature of uh, nature, the universal mother and have, and thus have instinctively acknowledged the principle of gender in the universe. Is this not so? But the hermetic teaching does not imply a real duality. The all is one. The two aspects are merely aspects of manifestation. The teaching is that the masculine principle manifested by the all stands in a way apart from the actual mental creation of the universe. It projects its will toward the feminine principle, which may be called nature, whereupon the latter begins the actual work of the evolution of the universe from simple centers of activity on to man and then on to still higher, all according to well-established and firmly enforced laws of nature. If you prefer the old figures of thought, you may think of the masculine principle as God, the Father, and of the feminine principle as nature, the universal mother, from whose womb all things have been born. This is more than a mere poetic figure of speech. It is an idea of the actual process of the creation of the universe. But always remember that the all is but one and that in its infinite mind, the universe is generated, created, and exists. It may help you to get the proper idea if you will apply the law of correspondence to yourself and your own mind. You know that the part of you, which you call I, in a sense, stands apart and witnesses the creation of mental images in your own mind. The part of your mind in which the mental generation is accomplished may be called the me in distinction from the I, which stands apart and witnesses and examines the thoughts, ideas, and images of the me. As above, so below, remember, and the phenomenon of one plane may be employed to solve the riddles of higher or lower planes. Is it any wonder that you, the child, feel that instinctive reverence for the all, which feeling we call religion, that respect and reverence for the father mind? 
Is it any wonder that when you consider the works and wonders of nature, you are overcome with a mighty feeling which has its roots away down in your inmost being? It is the mother mind that you are pressing close up to like a babe to the breast. Do not make the mistake of supposing that the little world you see around you, the earth, which is a mere grain of dust in the universe, is the universe itself. There are millions upon millions of such worlds and greater. And there are millions and millions of such universes in existence with the infinite mind of the all. And even in our own little solar system, there are regions and planes of life far higher than ours and beings compared to which we earthbound mortals are as slimy life forms that dwell on the ocean's bed when compared to man. There are beings with powers and attributes higher than man has ever dreamed of the gods possessing. And yet these beings were once as you and still lower, and you will be even as they and still higher in time. For such is the destiny of man as reported by the illumined. Who is this illumined they speak of? Is this the Illuminati itself? And death is not real, even in the relative sense. It is but birth to a new life. And you shall go on and on and on to higher and still higher planes of life. For eons upon eons of time, the universe is your home, and you shall explore its farthest recesses before the end of time. You are dwelling in the infinite mind of the all, and your possibilities and opportunities are infinite, both in time and space. And at the end of the grand cycle of eons, when the all shall draw back into itself, all of its creations, you will go gladly. For you will then be able to know the whole truth of being, at one with the all. Such is the report of the illumined, those who have advanced well along the path. And in the meantime, rest calm and serene. You are safe and protected by the infinite power of the Father, Mother, Mind.